Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you for the opportunity, uh, the second opportunity to present uh, this work. We've made a lot more progress um, in terms of, I would say, uncovering more questions. And so we're really excited um, to have this opportunity to like discuss uh, some of our thoughts and also get feedback from the group um, you know, on, on some of the questions. So it's even if people are attending uh, or joining at the latter half, um, that's, that's actually good because uh, that's where a lot of the confusions start. So I'm just going to begin with sharing um, my screen. Um, so this is actually building on two um, related, but uh, you know, temporarily distinct projects. The first one was trying to build a data set for um, claims detection in machine learning. And then the second, second project is our um, insights and like our questions about what that annotation process uh, says about the possibility of machine learning, but also what it tells us about uh, the, the efficacy of fact-checking. So both the aims and the efficacy of fact-checking. Uh, to give some background on why we were doing this work, as Scott mentioned, uh, we're a civic tech project based in India. Um, we wanted to build a searchable archive of content that is rele relevant to misinformation or broadly the information disorder. Uh, we crawl content from WhatsApp, but also other platforms that are popular in India. Uh, all our content is um, in Indian languages. Uh, there, there is English, but that's not uh, our focus. A lot of the content on WhatsApp can be English, but it's often um, mixed with different languages. Uh, and we, since there is a lot of work on English already, we try and focus on, on Indian languages. Uh, and just to give a scale, uh, like a sense of the scale, you know, the limit on data collection really comes from us as like the team in terms of how we build the scrapers and what limits we, we set. But um, I, I, in last year, we had over a million posts from an eight month period. So um, in, in the Indian social media landscape, you know, Twitter is often the most, the, uh, the pl platforms that's received the most in, uh, attention from researchers, but it's barely, you know, the, it's not it's not even in the top five, right? So you have WhatsApp, which is right on top, you have Facebook, but then you have ShareChat and Taka Tuck and George, which are platforms I'm sure uh, most people outside of India have not heard of, but all of these are platforms that um, encourage users. So Taka Tuck and Josh are actually TikTok-like platforms. So they uh, encourage users to make short videos um, and, and so again, the format is very different from Twitter. And then ShareChat is a platform that's a little bit like Reddit, but it encourages again, audio visual as a modality to communicate with text being of the minor modality. And that's something that uh, we see in uh, most sort of social media communication in, in India is that um, images and videos are far more important than, than text or textual themes. And there could be a lot of reasons for why that is, but um, I, I, I will only have untested conjectures on why that is, so I won't get into it. Okay, um, so this is, it's all in uh, mostly regional languages, but this is a, to give a sense of what this content looks like. Um, you have, you know, primarily a, a image, then you have some text describing the image. So that's the center, uh, sorry, that's the middle image. Um, the, the more common sort of um, content format is the one on the extreme left where you have an image, but you also have text embedded in it. It's like, it's almost like a, um, to preempt uh, Anushree's presentation, meme-like aesthetic. Um, and then uh, on the extreme right is what we, you know, often see on WhatsApp, which is that there'll be a video and then there'll be a claim preceding or following it. Now, the, the, our sort of foray into this problem space came from a very practical need of having to prioritize content, which is that when you have a million posts from an eight month period, uh, the usability becomes, you know, restricted because of the volume. And also that if you, if, when we want to make this con content searchable, it has a financial cost, um, which for like a small team like ours can be fairly prohibitive. So uh, when I say usability, whose usage and what uses are we concerned with, right? And so uh, we are building this archive because we want more storytelling and intervention around misinformation in India. In India. Uh, Twitter is not a platform from which you can generalize to um, the Indian context very well. 
And so one of the goals was if you have these data sets, it becomes easier for people to, you know, research on it, but you also, it also becomes easier for journalists to report on it. Um, so, so we use storytelling as a broad term, but that's, that's like the, you know, the journalistic community, the research community, um, maybe sort of activists in community-based storytellers. Um, that's the group that we are looking at, right? And so when we look at this group, um, what is the con type of content we want to prioritize? Um, so on the left, we see this image, which has these two boys, uh, you know, just posing and it's, it's a selfie of sorts. And that's not really the kind of content. It, it could be, I think, interesting from a research perspective, um, but it's not the sort of primary content, content we're interested in. Whereas the, the post on the right uh, is, is showing a baby who was, you know, found in a dumpster and it said that, oh, look, this was, this happened in so-and-so place. Uh, how, look how like sort of uh, downgraded the society, <laughs> the society is, right? So, and we're, we're definitely, instinctively, we know we're more interested in the content on the right. So um, we started with that broad, and, and I think this is a little different from how um, a lot of the research in this space is carried out, which is that you, once you've done a sort of broad literature view, you get a sense of where the research problem um, sort of, uh, or, or the, the missing gap in research is, and that's how a lot of, I think, uh, academic research has approached it, right? Like where you realize that, okay, this is, let's say either languages or say, you know, um, uh, detecting images, like that's the niche that has not been solved so far. In our case, we actually started with this need to solve a very practical problem. And so we didn't really know what the lay of the land in terms of the research was. Um, at this point, we were still trying to understand what our problem statement is, right? That are we trying to say that we should identify posts that should be archived, or are we trying to say that we should identify posts that shouldn't be archived? Um, so uh, for to even narrow down the problem statement, um, we had to basically familiarize ourselves with some data and we focused on this platform called ShareChat. Uh, because ShareChat encourages, it has an icon to share content on WhatsApp, uh, it's, it's sort of like trying to model itself, uh, to have the WhatsApp content aesthetic. Um, and it just made it like, there, there was a lot more content from ShareChat than there was for, from WhatsApp. So we focused on that and we had been scraping content daily from health, coronavirus, political and news buckets, because, um, some ethnographic work had shown that, uh, these are the categories in which most misinformation is shared. We collect content from a lot of, uh, from four languages on, from the platform, but for this um, sort of uh, research, we actually looked only at Hindi because that's the language that Anushree and I speak. And um, we picked out a sample from March to August and randomly sampled, you know, the, from the 2000 unique posts, 200,000 unique posts to understand, to like familiarize, familiarize ourselves with the data. So what we did was we asked three people to rank 400 posts each from a scale to one, a scale of one to five, uh, to ask them that, you know, and ask them, okay, just instinctively, what do you think is worth archiving? What do you think is not worth archiving? hundred posts were common to all three, um, uh, like all the three people. And, uh, what we did realize was that the three people were not agreeing on a lot of, um, sort of annotations, right? So like, uh, someone might have marked something a four, someone might have marked something a five. Um, but there were still like loose criteria for archiving um, sort of uh, these posts. And so um, he, like there might've been a disagreement between let's say a th like someone might've marked a post as a three and someone might've marked a post as a five. So one person might've said that I think it's, it's somewhat worth archiving and someone might've said that I think this is very important is worth archiving. But there was like some loose criteria uh, that we could see coming out from even this like initial exercise. Um, so after this, after this first survey of sorts, uh, Anushree and I loosely annotated and described 600 posts in a fair bit of detail, a detail to familiarize, familiarize ourselves, uh, uh, sort of a deeper, like familiarization with the data. And then we again repeated the process with 300 posts. So I'm just going to share, a, um, the sort of annotation guide, just give me a second. So just going to share what our uh, like guideline looked like at the time. Um, is everyone able to see this this Google sheet? 
Yep, we're seeing it. Okay, great. So, so yeah, as you can see, you know, we basically came up with like these 42-ish categories of the content in um, the in that data set, and um, we like some of this, and then we we tried to categorize, and this this is non mutually exclusive, right? So something. A post could be uh, could show physical violence, uh, but it could also be a description of a real world event or place, right? Um, it's a post could be some could be a newspaper clip and could also contain a statistical claim. So um, this was this was mine and Anushri's um, understanding of the six hundred and then three hundred posts that we were. Um, with like the, the categorization we had put them into. And we sort of kept uh, going back to other members of our team and giving them short sort of data samples and asking them to annotate and seeing whether there was any agreement on like these different, uh, these different categories, right? So um, we, we, we just asked them, can you rank, can you score this as a five, mark this as a five underscore zero three? Can you mark this as a five underscore zero nine? And uh, one of the things we realized was that, you know, there are certain categories where it's worth expecting agreement. And then there are certain categories where it's not worth expecting agreement, right? So um, in if we think of, let's say something like, um, sorry, uh, so, so, okay. If we think of something like hate speech, um, I think that's something that's fairly context um, and person dependent and the protocols for, when you want to annotate something like hate speech, what is probably a better approach is to do a, a sort of voting of send, sharing the same data with about you know five plus people and then seeing either a majority vote or a, you know how many people have marked this as a hate speech. And so uh, th that's the that's a place where you don't really want multiple people to agree on uh, whether something is hate speech or not, right? Because these are um, yeah, depending on people's backgrounds, depending on um, their community membership, the people's perceptions of these terms vary a lot. Um, but then there are certain other places. So for example, statistical claim, uh, quotes attributed to noteworthy individuals. These are places where we should expect agreement. And, um, and so that's where we narrowed our focus to these categories where, uh, which were actually uh, descriptors of content um, that made the content worth uh, sort of, or made the content worth verif verifying, right? So this is how we narrowed down to um, the this this uh, problem statement of saying that okay, for now let's leave out hate speech, and and that's that's definitely important. But uh, for now we need to break this down into multiple projects, and what we will focus on is uh, creating a data set of content that needs to be prioritized for verification. So with that, we then started looking at, okay, so what is the work that's been done on assessing checkworthiness of online content? And um, to a large extent, you know, the, the date, the samples have been overrepresented with, um, um, <coughs> have been overrepresented by data sets that look at US presidential debates. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of data sets that look at that. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of data sets that look at Twitter which is unsurprising, we, we know that Twitter is overrepresented. Uh, and there's some better analysis that looks at fake news articles, right? So for, for example, your online sites and, and what are the features that characterize whether that, that online site or the articles on that site are trustworthy. And then there are again, um, the Molina et al have looked at, for example, uh, attributes of content that make it, you know, the, the typology of fake news, so to say. Um, in, in some ways, this, you know, this was helpful, but at the same time, I think the data we were dealing with was quite distinct because US pre presidential debates, as well as textual claims are unimodal uh, data streams. And so the kind of approaches like what a claim is on in multimodal content is also somewhat different from um, what a claim is in, in a US presidential speech, right? And um, also that again, with, the kind of content that the platforms were looking at, the, Im the impetus is on uh, users sharing content. And in that case, the provenance or the source becomes, you know, uh, a lot less important. It's, it's almost, um, 
it's fairly difficult. People purposely obscure the source from which they've gotten this content because they want to um, they want to sort of sh show that they have actually created this content themselves, right? So, um, but just to also emphasize that even though uh, we think that multimodal content has been fairly underrepresented, there has been some work in the last two three years. Um, there is some work to talk about you know, textual claims about images. So this was the sort of middle category, the middle uh, sample that I'd shown in, in my one of my earlier slides. And then there is another data set that's looking at Reddit content that's been classified into the seven types of misinformation, um, which is a typology provided by Claire Waddle. And there's been, uh, again, languages predominantly, uh, the work has been on English, but there has been some work on Portuguese and in, there's one data set in, on Portuguese and Indian languages. And there's some work describing features across uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese. So I think gen the intersection that we thought that we found ourselves in, there wasn't a lot to look at, which was the multimodal content in non, uh, in basically in our case Hindi, but yeah, non-English. So and I and we thought that claims detection in if at this intersection, we really did not find um, any other data set. Um, so. <coughs> Just to, so when I'd shown you the Google um, drive, the annotation guidelines that we had, where we had 42 categories of those, about 16 were relevant to factual claims or basically check worthiness. And again, these are not mutually exclusive. So for the purposes of the final um, or the final rounds of the annotation, um, we collapsed those 16 categories into this table so that it would make um, annotations for other people easier. Uh, because the idea is that you're we're trying to create a guideline by which uh, that other people can follow and then mark this content and um if this guideline is good then you know or or in some ways robust like multiple like the people who use this guideline to mark content uh will have a high decently high agreement right um because we're saying that some of these features some of these um categories we should expect agreement on right so like statistical and numerical claim there shouldn't be too much subjectivity in in um, marking these so we had this annotation guide uh, 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 interface which is uh, not something I'm going to go into so now um, we then after we've created this this guideline we handed over the guideline to four annotators and Anushi and I were still in it but we split into separate groups and uh, each of us annotated 400 unique posts but we also annotated 200 posts that were common with another annotator. So in total, we had 2,200 posts. And um, we, they, we found that for a lot of the categories, we did find you know, decent agreement. So whether a post contained a claim or did not contain a claim, uh, there was very high agreement between, uh, between the annotators. What there was lesser agreement was on the specific kind of claim that was being made um, in, the, uh, in the posts. So, if, if it's a statistical claim or whether it is um, about a real world event or place, right? So th there's lesser agreement on that. Um, sim similarly, there's, you know, we also, because we were dealing with multi-modal content, what we, uh, we focused on was the kind of video that, um, or the intentionality portrayed in the video, right? So is it that the person is performing for a camera? Is it that the person, that it contains violent, uh, uh, the video contains a violent incident? Um, and this was based on the kind the um, 600 plus 900 posts that Anushi and I had annotated where we felt that a lot of times when people were performing for the camera, um, it, you know, if someone was performing for the camera and it did not check the boxes of um, sort of a factual claim. So a post that had a person performing for a camera but did not have a factual claim was perhaps an entertainment post and not something that was very relevant for uh, the archive that Tattle was creating. So uh, we wanted, again, this is how we were trying to capture the, the like intersection of like images and claims and, you know, videos and claims. Um, so, so we, we had a lot of in, sort of agreement on the kind of video uh, that post contained and the kind of image um, that post had. And um, yeah, and so those were the ones where the, agree the agreement was high, but th there were some of that where the agreement was like marginal, but, um, or moderate, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm just going to pause at that. So before, um, uh, handing it over to Anushree, I just want to go over a slide that I skipped. Um, 
so when i showed you the google that that sheet where we had 42 categories um this is at the stage when we were doing open coding right so we had broad categories like hate speech which was content targeting individuals or communities um there was the fake news like content um and again i'm using fake news as a term very broadly and then there was this catch all term that we had for memes um and you know some memes are we, we knew that some memes were relevant um but some memes were not so a lot of the memes were for example um jokes about for example marital relationships right and so we don't we clearly i mean we did not care that much unless you know there was a gender element to them um but then there were some memes that were about political figures and those were more important so we when we sort of um chris sort of filtered down those 42 categories to something uh sorry we filtered down the 42 categories to this this list of 16 um we also kept so that memes category is not here oh it is here sorry that contains relevant memes yeah so we also kept that category of saying does does this post contain relevant memes and this was really just a curiosity we wanted to see if like what gets captured in this um and so a lot of the uh, the in the annotated agreements are don't talk about the relevant memes because it's not really um it's not a category that was relevant to the claims detection work or the check worthiness work but it was something that we were very curious about that you know um again anushree and i had started seeing that you know there were memes that had certain claims and we were very confused whether this this would count as something that could be fact checked not fact checked so anyway we kept that as a category and so a lot of the work that now uh, anush will be presenting is is our findings from that category which we're very happy we kept so uh, anush i'll just keep talking about i'll keep forwarding the slides or do you want to share your screen no you can if you can do that okay. yeah i'll do that okay so handing it over to you uh, okay um so i'm just i'm just going to take off from uh, the point that tarun my ended at um and so uh, like after we sort of finished annotating the data set we uh, shifted our focus to this loosely bound sort of category of memes that we had and we thought that it was it was interesting um and that some kind of an analysis could be done on top of that so um uh, we did like a basic quantitative analysis of uh, how many posts fell under each category uh, that we used for our annotation work and uh, what we were struck by was that some posts that fell in both the memes and the factual claims category um, were sort of interesting to uh, look at and uh, we thought that it was worth investigating further um then if you can just go yeah. to the first next slide um so uh, to be precise like there were 28% of uh, memes that had some kind of factual claims or some kind of verifiable claim uh, within them um what we sort of uh, like while the definition of the factual claims that we were using was quite broad um it was also interesting to sort of note that these posts problematized that exact definition also and uh, because memes were being used as a tool to uh, sort of um, make factual claims um so as you can see in both the examples that i've included in this slide um if there's a need for translation i can uh, do that as well so the first um, uh, image sort of talks about how um okay so the first image is uh, contains arvin kejriwal and uh, uh, priyanka gandhi i think um, and uh, arvin kejriwal is sort of asking this question to her uh, as um, uh, saying where do you park the 1000 buses um uh, at night yeah and uh, she she responds uh, by saying that uh, at the same place where you sort of uh, um where you feed 4 lakh people uh, during the day um so, so just to give some this context on this anushree if i could uh, just backtrack so these are both politically relevant figures in india um arvind kejriwal so this is when the covid cases in delhi were spiking and different political candidates were trying to you know sort of provide relief work and so that's yeah. a meme around that but yeah go ahead uh and the second second post is then uh this is uh, bjp spokesperson sambit patra whose image has been included and it's supposedly making uh, like presenting a quote from him saying that uh, the petrol prices have been hiked by uh, prime minister modi uh, because uh, so that uh, no one asks for a bike um, in as a dowry uh, item um so uh, and this is again in the context of like petrol prices hiking so this is kind of like normalizing or like making fun of that entire uh, move by the government and of course during during a global pandemic so 
that's where the sort of dark humorish joke lies in um so uh, both of these posts are sort of satirical or sort of commentative in nature uh, but what we sort of want to uh, argue through this paper is that um these are one of the many ways through which political discourse uh, takes shape and is subsequently performed with and both of these kind of narratives have very real world con uh, consequences so contextualizing these two posts for example if, uh, like i explained will reveal that they have a particular kind of social cultural meaning and associations in the political context that they are shared in and circulated in um so through this sort of analysis like looking at this uh, overlap between memes and factual claims what um, we want to draw attention to then is that memes or meme like uh, posts build on as well as uh, make factual claims uh, which then requires attention by fact checkers too and through our analysis um, we hope to show that uh, like how uh, our annotation process reveal that the boundaries of factuality are blurry um and using like uh, during my presentation i'll present some specific examples uh, from the political discourse uh, that can be observed on indian social media platforms um largely focusing on share chat content of course um and yeah like try and uh, see how uh, this has significance for fact checking work um so before we do that um, i'll just talk briefly a little bit about both the categories memes and facts how they've been understood in literature um so uh, for memes uh, like memes are inherently a very nebulous uh, ambiguous kind of a category and uh, the origins of this lie in the study of memetics uh, which is um, uh, which falls under biology um so they can mean a really broad range of things uh, but uh, like I'll, uh, richard dawkins was the first one who sort of coined this term um as a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation um subsequently uh, psychologist lian gabora also talks about memes as a mental representation of anything that can be the subject of an instant of experience um and uh, like uh, post that i think the most uh, broadly and most commonly accepted definitions of memes at least from memetics has been of susan blackmore's definition uh, which considered considers it as an element of a culture that may be considered uh, to be passed on by non genetic means especially imitation so the focus on uh, in the study of memetics um, uh, is imitation whereas when it uh, trans like when we look at memes in the context of internet uh, or the internet or as an internet meme as a as an entity um, what is sort of highlighted is their ability to be remixed or altered um, and the ability to sort of absorb intention and express a particular kind of orientation um so while the ambiguity is still um something that is carried over to the internet meme uh, concept um the definitions then sort of um, uh, highlight how it can be replicated uh, or remixed or uh, adapted to different kinds of uh, social cultural context um i'm going to talk about shiffman's definition in particular because that's the one that uh, i i felt was most useful in this analysis so he talks about uh, memes as units of popular culture that are circulated imitated and transformed by individual internet users creating a shared cultural experience in the process um and he says that there are three axes along which the replication of memes takes place which is uh, content form and stance um uh, stance uh, the a bit about stance is actually what i found most relevant um because that talks about um it allows um user agency to emerge and um, it indicates the uh, like information that memes convey about their own communication so users can then sort of um uh, express their own discursive orientations and positions which then lends itself to a uh, political discourse um and like uh, participatory cultures also uh, so that's the next bit uh, through which memes can also be understood uh, as open and adaptable objects of participation or artifacts of participatory digital cultures so participatory digital cultures in particular are sort of these spaces of uh, sort of uh, relatively free artistic uh, uh, and civic engagement where people uh, create and share their own creations and that sort of that behavior is encouraged um and members have some kind of degree of social connection even if it's they're, they're loosely connected um so that's the kind of um space that memes help generate and then they can be sort of understood as um socially constituted performative acts that have some intentionality to them um and also have a lot of potential for having offline consequences in spite of them being virtual uh, artifacts um so this is what um um uh, mick sort of uh, refers to as the uh, like this is why memes have social uh, like potential for social and political change and that's that's the kind of significance for uh, political discourse as well um 
um, which then brings me to the next point about the specific subcategory of memes, which is political memes um, that help us understand some of the memes we saw in our data set. Um, so we look at specifically the multi-layered and shifting nature of uh, meanings of political memes and how they indicate user agency and political expression in the context of Indian political discourse. Um, particularly to look at uh, like political memes um, have, have been considered as satirical or humor, like those are the lessons that they've been understood uh, through. Um, but political humor um, like also has a much wider range of potential um, like and it invokes others uh, several uh, other affective dimensions um, and memes have been understood also as ways uh, through which their creators uh, leverage popular culture itself as a political tool they also have subversive potential um, and um, I'd just like, uh, as a side, uh, as an aside, I'd also like to sort of point, point out that a lot of theorists have considered them as uh, objects that should be preserved. So that was also an impulse that we were operating with when we understood them as objects of immense um, value, uh, which are, like their cultural artifacts are, um, um, sorry, that they use cultural artifacts to construct shared norms and values, and they capture information and meanings um, that are produced collaboratively by users in these network discursive spaces through which they emerge, and hence um, they constitute a part of our collective digital heritage. Um, so they also have archival importance, uh, so to speak. Um, moving on to then um, the idea of uh, facts. Um, so facts are understood in opposition to values. Um, they're supposed to be grounded in reality or in a state of affairs. Um, and they are what they're the entities that make propositions true. And they're basically, they're supposed to correspond to truth, but the nature of actual knowledge is, um, or assert, ascertaining something as true or false is uh, a matter of heated debate in the context of post-truth or a post-fact world. Um, so uh, here I'd like to sort of go back to uh, the idea of social construction of scientific facts that a lot of sociologists, historians, and philosophers of science um, have argued for in terms of the interpretive uh, properties of scientific facts and demonstrating how they are socially constructed um, and how there is the subsequent possibility of uh, multiple coexisting interpretations. Um, in particular, Shapin's uh, idea of uh, how uh, truth is made socially uh, insists on approaching these questions of truthfulness and falsity with the lens of collective agency, participation, and group judgment, um, which makes truth itself a socially constructed entity. Um, but the assertion that I think uh, we'd like to make through this work is also to say that this, is, this doesn't mean that there are, there are no facts or truth, uh, but that it is fundamenta fundamentally political to call something truthful or factual. Um, and this then shifts the focus to the enterprises of truth making, such as news and media ecologies, uh, and the shifts that happen in publicly relevant factual information and the way that it is interpreted um, uh, within and I mean not uh, not just limited to political discourse uh, as a result of uh, new modes of uh, news making and public discourse such as social media platforms uh, emerging. Um, so, um, uh, like I'll just go briefly into the bit of our journalistic practice and how. Um, the idea of objectivity uh, is, is a regulatory ideal uh, for journalistic practice. Um, so journalists, uh, like they consider objectivity as the best way to uh, truth and objectivity within journalism is understood as multifaceted in nature and constituted by values, procedures and languages. Um, however, uh, almost all journalists, especially in current times, uh, acknowledge that news is not purely objective anymore. Um, and they don't claim that everything that is reported in the news is factual or can be considered absolutely truthful. Um, and it, uh, news no, it simply does not represent reality anymore. Um, so uh, what then a couple of theorists around uh, like talking about journalism have argued is that uh, like, there is a coherentist conception of knowledge that journalists operate with. Uh, using which they validate new information and the practice of objectivity then sort of necessitates this kind of interpretive flexibility for good journalistic practice. Um, and objectivity still remains an important ideal to strive towards, um, which is what the point about regulatory ideal uh, for journalistic practice means, uh, because uh, there are a couple of other theorists uh, like uh, Viviana Zel uh, sorry, uh, Bobby Zelizer, who talks about uh, journalists as, in as an interpretive community uh, that reflects, revisits, and has in several instances, in fact, self-corrected. Um, but other theorists have then also go, gone on to point out that these porous boundaries of journalism is exactly what presents challenges for um, objective practice and ascertaining truth and falsity uh, of what is being reported. Um, 
this has then also opened up uh, debates around how news is presented. Um, and in the post-truth sort of context, asserting the existence of these multiple interpretations should then aim to reorient the process of truth-seeking within journalism, repoliticizing facts and foregrounding public interest instead of uh, preserving political authority. Um, and this is an argument that has been made from within the journalistic community as well. Um, even though um, like I'm, I'm going to sort of flag that the context of these arguments um, are not necessarily uh, Indian in that sense. Um, so this brings us to the uh, the enterprise of fact checking, um, which is increasingly uh, crucial to the uh, like to the practice of journalism itself uh, today. So uh, Lucas Graves, for instance, has argued that fact checkers also use this uh, to use factual coherence as a method to verify the truthfulness uh, of a claim. Um, the uh, uh, like the primary objective of fact checking has been considered as uh, I mean, in the domain of uh, verifying political statements and publicly available knowledge um, within media political landscapes. And this is then sort of what brings us to talking about how, um, like what are the epistemological assumptions also that fact-checking makes and uh, how does that change in the context of uh, social media-based news, uh, news ecologies. Um, so some critics of journalists uh, of uh, fact-checking have sort of said that the, the distinction between truth and food falls um, that fact-checking assumes may be oversimplified. Um, there have been rebuttals can be smoothed out by smoothing out emotional analysis and um, uh, like uh, shifting the focus onto how fact-checking practices are happening. Um, However, also considering narratives as fundamentally constructed and uh, political, we want to argue that there are uh, similarities between facts and narratives as well. And that's why narratives also sort of demand fact-checking attention. Um, hence these new modes of expression through means and their narrative building power, uh, which enable individual expression, then form an important part of the political discourse, which uh, sparely falls under the purview of fact-checking work. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll just uh, like a brief call back to some, some of the things that Tarima said about uh, the categories that the way that we define the categories. Um, the two categories, of course, that are relevant for this um, paper are that of factual claims and memes. Um, so factual claims, uh, since we, we've been calling them factual claims because uh, there was no way that we ourselves could have ascertained their um, the veracity of the claims that were being made. So uh, we limited our uh, definition to un like understanding them as claims and not as facts themselves, which also lent itself to this analysis really well. Um, the second bit, the second category of the memes is also, uh, I mean, uh, we specified certain filters about which were culturally relevant and uh, also spatio-temporally uh, relevant at that point in time when we were doing the annotations. Um, and like Dhanma said, the cultural ideas of what constitutes hate speech varies. Uh, we couldn't pinpoint hate speech as an identifiable phenomenon uh, in the specific post or sort of come up with this detailed sort of text, taxonomy um, for all the things that would fall under the category of hate speech. So we also tried to um, uh, like bake the idea of hate speech into this uh, catch-all category of memes. Uh, which was then attentive to the thematic significance of hate speech uh, while also allowing us to retain the nebulous nature of memes as a content type. Um, so yeah, so I'll just uh, briefly talk about these uh, couple of examples. Uh, the first set of examples is, talk, uh, is it shows how participation in political discourse uh, is exemplified through these memes. Uh, the one, the examples that we see on the left are sort of uh, peddling pro-government narratives, while the one on the right are anti-government narratives. And they, like, we can see that they use a lot of um, contextual information and sort of affective ways of expressing uh, either support or dissent against or for the government. Um, and all of these contain like verifiable uh, claims. So for instance, uh, I'll just uh, talk about the one on the left. Um, um, yeah, so uh, that talks about, uh, like on, uh, there's an image of Manmohan Singh delivering a speech and there's an image of uh, uh, Narendra Modi uh, walking on an army base uh, in Leh. And both of these images were really uh, widely circulated at that point of time. And there's a meme made out of uh, that to sort of um, argue that uh, uh, Narendra Modi's government and him as a personality are more masculine, um, while um, um, Manmohan Singh's government was not. So it's a way of sort of uh, criticizing the government and I mean, uh, uh, supporting the government and criticizing the previous dispensation. 
Um, similarly, on the right, uh, there's another meme, uh, a sort of, a sort of cartoon, which uh, talks about how, I mean, it's, it's a cartoon on the privatization of the Indian railways. Um, and it, there's, it's, it criti criticizes the move um, that the railways have been privatized and they will now sort of uh, be more expensive or like it'll be more difficult to use them. And that has been solely um, like the Modi government's uh, responsibility and it's a problem because it's sort of a satirical uh, cartoon. Um, so uh, yeah, and some of the other things also that we'd observed around uh, memes like these was how um, like these emojis were used, uh, tags and emojis were also sort of used and other linguistic styles and uh, elements were used to indicate how these new shared norms and um, uh, were being created by the users or the creators of these memes um, and how they were sort of uh, negotiating existing practices and genres of uh, these discourses. Um, and this again, like I'd like to point out a little bit about Stan um, that uh, Lemo Shukman had mentioned that they are taking the creators and the people who are circulating these memes are taking certain uh, discursive uh, stances. And that's also really evident uh, in all of these memes. Um, yeah, the second uh, category then uh, talks about statistical claims that we observed in memes. Um, uh, yeah, so the one on the left is again a sort of pro-government meme and we can um, see that, I mean, even though they uh, don't mention the exact sources from where these statistics have been taken, we assume that they were um, claims because there were numbers listed and they can be um, interpreted as within, I, I, on, in the context of social media, um, in the way that posts circulate, we assume that they can be interpreted as uh, facts or factual claims. Um, and we can like clearly see the way that uh, the image has been used, um, uh, that in the Modi's image has been used in both these posts. In fact, I'll come to that as well. Um, is that this one is a pro-government sort of post uh, showing how that the Indian government apparently handles the pandemic better than uh, most other countries in the world, while the one on the right shows uh, Modi with a head bent image. So that's uh, disapproval or like um, it shows sort of criticism of the government and how um, there are sort of like allegations of corruption in the way that the Rafael deal was uh, carried out. Um, and both these posts sort of use uh, numerical uh, claims to um, sort of make both these narratives. Um, and um, yeah, the third category of memes is actually uh, like this, I've just included this one example to talk about how, and we saw this like a, a couple of times all between the four of us, we saw these, uh, this particular image of this particular um, news piece, so to speak, a couple of times. And uh, we thought it was interesting because it, uh, I, I, it, it, it seemed like an inside joke um, because it was using very colloquial sort of phrases and uh, um, emojis are in fact the only way that one can actually ascertain that this is a meme. Um, so they are, uh, to just to uh, like give some context about this, they're um, poking fun at the prospect of this uh, alleged criminal uh, Kamran Amin, um, who threatened to kill the uh, chief minister of Uttar Pradesh and he's been arrested. So now the meme is sort of poking fun at the fact that oh, he won't be, uh, like he won't survive um, the police custody, etc. So uh, yeah, um, that sort of brings me to the conclusion. Um, so uh, we, we, the way that we've, we've been thinking about how this is significant for fact checking is that um, what our annotation process sort of indicated is that these, uh, the overlap between the, these two categories showed us that the boundaries um, were blurry um, when looked at from this perspective. Uh, and this uh, like the uh, uh, more, common, like the increasing presence of user-generated multimodal content um, was the reason why these boundaries were being blurred. And that also changed what uh, we can consider as a fact. Um, and that narrative-based factual claims are also becoming fairly significant. Um, so what we want to say is that this has implications for fact-checking work and understanding where factual claims can be found, uh, what would be the form and aesthetic uh, and like the way that they appear uh, in social media content and um, like specifically looking at multimodal content and arguing that content forms like memes also have factual claims within them. Um, that's the basic thrust of this paper. Um, what we are veering towards uh, um, in terms of building an argument um, like uh, for 
promoting sort of reflexivity around the way that fact-checking work is done also, or um, I mean, that's a tentative direction, but uh, the way that we're thinking about this is also that this can help sort of challenge the universality of uh, IFCN guidelines since IFCN sort of emerged in a very particular um, political context and uh, they can't be sort of universally applicable. Um, and um, yeah, so like the, the paper sort of tries to present uh, evidence from the political context of India um, gathered through the political discourse that we witnessed on social media platforms, particularly ShareChat, which can help revisit these guidelines and help adapt them to the political context of India, which is um, vastly different um, from the context that the guidelines sort of emerged in and help fact checkers who are looking at the misinformation problem in India. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have.